what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling you, made all the darkness depart. Heaven, 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 and glory filled my soul. slices on the plate. Let me tell you a story, and then you can eat the pie. No! Why? But I'm hungry! Come on, Gumbo! Don't be so greedy! First, let me tell you the story. Once, there lived a little girl named Jess. She had a younger brother called William. They used to go to the same school. One day, after coming back home from school, they were very hungry. They wanted to eat something. 
That morning, their mother had baked a cake. They opened the refrigerator and saw there was just enough left for each one of them to have a slice. William slurped, seeing the piece of cake. He said, Let's have the cake with some milk. I'll slice the cake while you go get us two glasses of milk. Jess happily went to the kitchen to get two glasses of milk for them. William began to slice the cake, but the slices were not equal in size. One was much larger than the other. By now, Jess had come to the table with two glasses of milk. William brought the cake and placed a small slice in front of Jess, and he himself took the larger piece. What have you done? You gave me the small slice of the cake and kept the bigger one for yourself? That is so mean! I would have never given you the smaller piece. Instead, I would have taken the smaller piece and given the large piece to you. No! You would have never done that! Of course I would have. I would have thought about you first. William felt bad. He knew he was being selfish. Jess was hungry too, like him. I am sorry, Jess. Here, take some more from me. William cut a piece from his own slice of cake and gave it to Jess. Jess hugged William. They both laughed and began eating their cakes and drank up the milk. So, the moral of the story is that God is good and if He gives us more than what we need, we should share it with those who do not have much. We should never be greedy and keep everything for ourselves. All right. I'm sorry for taking away the larger slice first. That's okay. I'll break some from your slice and give it to Tubby and Freckles so that all three of you get equal amounts of pie. Yes, Holy. Please do that. Yum! That was delicious! I have fixed my mind on another time on another time and here I mean to stand on till God gives me more light. And there is today, today, today. Another time, and another time. I have set my course on the narrow way, on the narrow way, for I know the time. Is close at hand, for oh, which I watch and pray. And there is today, 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 until he comes. I have set my course on the narrow way. Even so, Lord, come quickly. This is my fervent prayer. For I've caught a glimpse of glory and I'm longing. When 
shall the son of man appear? The trumpet sound its blast, and Christ descend in glorious fire with all the saints amassed. We'll rise with those who sleep no more to meet him every year. And shall the Son of Man The Son of Man appeared. Even so, Lord, come quickly. This is my fervent prayer. For I've caught a glimpse of glory and am longing to. For I've caught a glimpse of glory And I'm longing to be there I have sent my mind on another time on another time I'd like to say a pleasant good morning and a happy Sabbath to all of you at Liberty International. I want to say I am grateful to be here once again for another week. It was a pleasure to be with you last week, and it's a pleasure for me to be with you again. I'm pretty sure Pastor Chapman will be here next week. I'd like to thank him for the opportunity to be with you once again for another Sabbath worship. So happy Sabbath to every single one of you from all over the world, wherever you are, in Europe, in Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, wherever this video reaches, I want to wish you a happy Sabbath and say welcome once again to another worship service here at Liberty International. For those who don't know, my name is Brother Malcolm Emilaire, and I want to say from wherever you are, in all your homes, wherever you are, it's a pleasure to meet you digitally, and I pray one day, because of what we are doing here, my friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ going out into the world, we will one day meet in the great by and by, the heavenly kingdom and the earth made new. We can meet together face to face and share the wonderful experiences that have taken us through life because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without further ado, we get into the spoken word today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as I open my mouth once again to speak, dear Father, I do not depend on my own intellect. I depend upon the utterance of your Holy Spirit. Impress upon me the words to speak as you have prepared them in me. I pray, dear Father, that all your people listening will receive a word from you today. We are attentive to the voice of your Holy Spirit. Whatever you have for us today, tailor this message to fit every person as they need to hear it the most. And whatever decisions that need to be made for Christ today, I pray, dear Father, that you will direct your people to make them. And, dear Lord, we do not stop short to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, today the topic is Naboth's Vineyard. We are taking a trip into Naboth's Vineyard. We are understanding the account that took place between Naboth, Ahab, King Ahab, and Queen Jezebel. The illustration is found in 1 Kings, and you will go there with me to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 21. 
Today we are looking at this account given in 1 Kings 21 and we are also finding some key messages that God has in store for us today. 1 Kings chapter 21, your Bibles are open, pen and paper if needs be, that you can make some note notifications for your study. The Bible reads in 1 Kings 21, I'm reading from verse 1 through 3 of 1 Kings chapter 21. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Let's stop here for this moment. Let us examine the particulars that we are looking at in 1 Kings chapter 21. Number one, you have Naboth's vineyard. You have Naboth the Jezreelite who had a vineyard. Number two, you have Ahab king of Samaria. And the Bible says Ahab king of Samaria observes the vineyard of Naboth. Ahab wants the vineyard of Naboth. He doesn't want it as a vineyard. He wants to plant a garden of herbs. To Naboth, the vineyard is not just any vineyard because after all, Ahab offers a better vineyard. As king, he has great property and land, great property with vineyards. So he offers Naboth a better vineyard. To Ahab, it's a piece of land. To Naboth, though, it is not just a piece of land and a vineyard. It is an inheritance. And being it is an inheritance, he desires to keep it that way. Understand this first principle. Honor, integrity does not have a price. And so it is Naboth's duty to keep his family inheritance. But to Ahab, it is just a piece of land and it is convenient for whatever he desires it to be. So I want to establish in our minds today, when it comes to being a leader, a leader will either see what he wants to see in something or someone, or the leader will see what God intends for them to see. That's the first principle we are taking in, uh, into our minds here today when we are looking at Naboth and Ahab going beyond what is happening here. We have the immediacy of the illustration and we have what it means to us today. So let's move on. 1 Kings chapter 21. Now we are looking at verses 4 through 7. The Bible reads, Ahab came into his house after hearing the fact that Naboth would not sell him under any circumstances the vineyard for him to make his garden of herbs. Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said to Ahab, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. It's not for sale. And so Ahab laid him down on his bed and turned away his face, and the man would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And, the, and he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. Listen to this story very carefully, my friends. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern 
the kingdom of Israel. Listen, man, arise, eat bread, let your heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So what are we witnessing here? The transition from verses 1 through 3, now 4 through 7. We see now that the vineyard has become more than a want for Ahab. He covets, the Bible says, he covets, the Bible illustrates, the vineyard of Naboth. Why do I say this? Listen, when you go back, the Bible says, a, a neighbor of the Jezreelite had a vineyard in verse 1 that was hard by the place of Ahab. Hard meaning it was right there. It is hard by the castle. So therefore, when Ahab wakes up in the morning, there is the vineyard. During the day, there is the vineyard. When he goes to sleep, there is the vineyard. You cannot miss it. It is hard by the castle. It is right there, yet it is not his. It is not his land because that is not his inheritance. The castle he rules over, but the vineyard he does not. And so he goes beyond wanting it. He covets it. And the fact that it is near to him, it is a progressive and degenerative covetousness. He ponders on it. He desires it. He lusts for it. And I want you to understand today that covetousness doesn't rest until its lust is satisfied. When the Bible says, thou shalt not covet, the Bible understands that when we covet, we will not rest until we have what we covet. And we will use any means to get it, my brothers and my sisters. So covetousness now is consuming Ahab. And Naboth will not part with what he covets. And that means there is no lawful means by which Ahab can get this vineyard. He, Naboth will not accept another vineyard for it. Naboth will not accept money for it. There is nothing lawful that Ahab can do to get the vineyard. So he goes home and like a petulant child, he will not eat. He, he frowns and he mopes around and lays on his bed until his wife comes home and says, what, what is your problem? Why is your countenance fallen? Why have you eaten no bread? And like a child, he tells his wife, Naboth will not give me his vineyard. So Jezebel, and then you know Jezebel, when you know the account of Jezebel in the Bible, that name is very, very um, familiar with everybody who reads the Bible. Jezebel don't play. And so Jezebel says, I now will take this charge. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Let's look at now. 1 Kings 21, 8 to 10. So Jezebel gets to work. The Bible says in, second, in 1 Kings 21, 8 to 10, So she wrote letters in what? In Ahab's name and sealed them with Ahab's seal. Sent the letters to the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Listen to what the Bible is saying here, brothers and sisters. And set to men, sons of Belial before him, to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. Note the manner of Jezebel's work. Remember what I said. There is no lawful means by which Ahab the king can get the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So when Jezebel says, I will get the vineyard for you, we need to, uh, we need to investigate 
the manner in which Jezebel works. Ahab is not innocent because Jezebel can only work through his authority. She wrote letters in the name of Ahab. She sealed it with the seal of Ahab. She is working through the elders and the nobles of the place in which Naboth lived. And so it, it, it is men who the people respect and the people will listen to. She's working through the king, through the elders and the noblemen. So it is men even Naboth will not expect vile treatment from. Jezebel also says, proclaim a fast. Do the thing which God commands to do in times where you either want to repent or in times where you want to give glory or in times where you want to sacrifice. Proclaim a fast. When a fast is proclaimed, you would never believe that something evil is at hand. So she said, proclaim a fast. Set Naboth on high. Carry him through the city and set two sons of Belial. Why two sons of Belial? Look at Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. Deuteronomy 19 verse 15. She said very carefully, select two sons of Belial or Satan to bear witness. Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. Listen to what the Bible says. God's charge to the children of Israel. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. That is why she says, set two sons of Belial and in addition to the letter of the king, that, uh, that is three witnesses against Naboth. What is the charge that Jezebel says? First Kings chapter 21 and the Bible says, verse 10, that Naboth, the sons of Belial said, blaspheme God and the king. Let us look at the charge. Exodus 22 and verse 28, Exodus chapter 22 and verse 28. These are serious charges levied against Naboth. Listen to what the Bible says in Exodus 22, 28. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. These two charges are grievous. When it comes to God's people. So the question I want to ask you today, Liberty International, brothers and sisters in Christ, has Jezebel studied the ways of Israel? Does Jezebel understand how Israel functions? Israel is a pagan queen. Israel's father is Eth Baal, one who is with Baal. Her people worships Baal. That is Ahab's wife. He took to daughter, the, he took to wife the daughter of Eth Baal, one who is with Baal, the god of the Zidonians. That's who Ahab has as his wife. Jezebel is working through lies and deceit. She is working in pagan form. The question I want you to understand and ask yourself today as you look at this illustration, is it open or is it masked? She's working through deceit and lies under the guise of truth. She has two sons of Belial prophet, blast, um, pro, um, testifying against Naboth, an innocent man saying this man blasphemed God and the king, and she's working through men who the people respect. What happens? Let's go on. Let's look at verse 11 and through verse 15 of 1 Kings 21. Let's read the rest of the account. The Bible says, And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, 
who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And as it was written in the letters, which she had sent unto them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. Everything that Jezebel required of the elders and the noblemen, they did. And it was done to Naboth as Jezebel commanded. It is there that Ahab arises and goes down to the vineyard of Naboth to take possession of it. And it is there that the word of the Lord now comes to Elijah and says, Go meet with Ahab in which is king of Israel in Samaria. He is right now in the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, whom he killed. And it is there that Elijah goes to Naboth, goes to Ahab and confronts him concerning Naboth and said, Has thou killed and also taken possession? And it is there that Ahab says to Elijah, Oh, my enemy, you have found me. Elijah says, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 20, look at this account. Ahab said to Elijah, Has thou found me, O mine enemy? He said, I have found thee, Ahab, not because I am your enemy, but because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. And it is there that Elijah pronounces upon the house of Ahab desolation. Dogs will lick the blood of Ahab, he says. Dogs will lick the blood of Jezebel. Dogs will lick the blood of your posterity. Judgment is brought to the house of Ahab because of the evil that he perpetrated through his reign, leading up to the death of this innocent man and taking his inheritance for himself. Now, with the backdrop of this illustration here, let's understand a few principles that I want to drive home today, my brothers and my sisters. Going back to the illustration of Naboth, the owner by inheritance is Naboth. Naboth is the overseer. Ahab is also an overseer. He is king in Israel. He is chosen by the people to rule. So he is an overseer in his own right. He took to wife Jezebel, as I said, daughter of Ethbaal. He is unequally yoked, is unequally yoked as king of Israel with a pagan wife. Go to John chapter 6. Let's begin to get understanding. John chapter 6. Verse 37 to 40, listen to what the Bible says. As Jesus himself said in person when he was on this earth, he says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that shall come to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which have sent me, that all which he have given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus is saying, 
I have been given charge over salvation. I have been given charge over all who will come to God through me. I will be the overseer of all that come to God in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, being the overseer, being the one in charge, I will accomplish the will of God in the life of all who comes. I will save them from sin and I will grant to them eternal life. As I will receive when I die and I rise again. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What I want us to understand today, as Jesus viewed those he came to save, and as God views his people, the overseer, the leader, must see what God sees and fulfill God's plan for his desired end. I want us to understand that. Every leader of people who also claim to be the leader of God's people here on earth ought to see not what they want to see, but what God sees. What God desires for people is salvation. And what God desires to grant unto his people is everlasting life in the earth made new. Now there is a problem when it comes to a leader and an overseer of God's people. There is a problem that we are to be mindful of. Every single one of us in this world, subject to leadership, must understand what the problem is. Because as we saw in, in 1 Kings 21, how Jezebel is operating. Jezebel is not operating having the people to do pagan things to accomplish her purpose. She's saying, proclaim a fast. She's using the king's seal. She's writing in the name of the king. She is underhanded. There is a problem that I want us to understand in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 20, when God is speaking to the church of Thyatira, there is a problem that God says there is with the church. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Why? Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to the what? To teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. In Revelation, Jezebel, the person, is long gone. But God says the spirit of Jezebel is still running roughshod in Christianity. The doctrine of Jezebel is still prevalent in the fact that my people are being taught by Jezebel. The doctrine of Jezebel is seducing my servants. They are committing fornication and they are taking in spurious doctrine. The Bible says Jezebel is not just calling herself a queen, but a prophetess. She is bringing messages. She is teaching and seducing the servants because the devil understands when he corrupts the leadership, he corrupts the church. He corrupts the people. Apostate leadership has always led to fallen and sinful people. So it is incumbent upon our leaders today, it is incumbent upon them to be careful what they are taught and who they are aligned with in receiving feeding. And it is incumbent upon people today to really take stock the congregations that they are a part of. What is my leader giving me? Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. The devil is working a great work in this world right now in many a church where people believe 
that they are receiving good food. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'm reading verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. How are the teachers operating? Who, sh who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And, and you, you think people won't follow them? Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Let's understand the Bible here, my friends. The Bible says as there were false prophets in Israel, as there were false prophets in the time of Christ, there are false prophets among you today. They will privily. That means they will not operate in the open. They will operate by stealth. How Jezebel operated in the past, they are operating today. Privily, stealthily, like an assassin. They will bring in damnable heresies, destructive falsehoods. They will use the Bible and will twist the words of the Bible to bring in destructive doctrines. Things that need to be tested so you can see it is not the truth. The Bible says, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction, they cannot operate in the Lord because they are not of the truth. So they are not leading you to worship God. They have established a throne, not a ministry. It is under the disguise of ministry, but any time a man will bid you to follow him and not God, my brothers and my sisters, you're already in trouble. Any time your leader is operating like a king and not a servant, that is a problem. God says, let, we are not arguing as the Gentiles do about position and authority. He that is greatest among you, let him be your servant. No man usurps authority over God's people because he himself is a servant of the Lord. He is charged, as God said to Peter, feed my sheep. That's what he does. Feed the sheep, point them to Christ, never to himself. So the Bible says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways. You know why? Pernicious is sensual. They tantalize you. They attract you. They seduce you with their words and their mannerisms and their, their, their lavish lives of luxury. And they present themselves to you and you are tantalized and hypnotized by them. The Bible says these are the men like the Pied Piper who blow the pipe and command the attention of the people. Many are following blind leaders. Many shall follow their sensual ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These men are causing destruction in the world. That's why many people today are disenchanted with Christianity. They are disenchanted with churches because of the work that many leaders are doing to, to misrepresent God in this world. People are laughing at the world of Christianity. These are the reasons why the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These men are not accurate representations of ministers of God. So people are using them as the measuring stick which is wrong. The Bible says through covetousness, they just simply want to increase in wealth and stature. They want your worship. They want your money. So through covetousness, shall they with feigned words, words they make up out of their own intellect, not what the Bible says. They use scripture, but with their own twist. 
Feigned means self-molded. They create their own doctrines. They create what the scripture says. And the Bible says, they make merchandise of you. They buy and sell you with their words. The Bible says, do not worry though, that judgment does not linger. Judgment is coming upon every single person who has misrepresented God. Judgment is coming upon every leader who has scattered God's sheep. Judgment is coming upon every leader who has prayed, P-R-E-Y, on God's sheep. Sadly, I must say, my friends, the Bible says there are blind leaders in this world. If you follow a blind leader, the Bible says everyone will fall in a ditch. There is no excuse to simply follow a blind leader and fall into a ditch. The Lord said now is the time where everything must be tested. Test every spirit. Test every sermon. Test every person presenting the sermon. Test every person presenting a Bible study. Look in the Bible to see whether that person is speaking the truth as it is written. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. I, presenting myself before you today, must tell you the scripture, send you to the scripture. You read it for yourself and you discern, is Brother Malcolm speaking according to the word? If he is not speaking according to the word, call Pastor Chapman and say to Pastor Chapman, Brother Malcolm has not spoken according to the word. Reprove him. I don't care how well I speak today. I don't care how nice my smile is. I have a responsibility when I have commanded your attention for the last 30 minutes to speak according to God's word. Not cutting corners, my brothers and sisters, to make you feel good or make you like me. The time is coming these last days where everything must be tested. Go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verses 30 to 34. Proverbs 24, 30 to 34. I went by the field of the slothful. And by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns. And nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. What was the instruction? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. My brothers and my sisters, it becometh us as leaders to understand how diligent we must be in tending the flock of God. It's not our flock. We did not die for the sheep. The sheep was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been put in charge of it. To feed them and nurture them in the fear of the Lord. The Bible says, I walked by the vineyard of the slothful. And the man who had no understanding. I walked by the church of the slothful. I walked by the ministry of the man who was void of understanding. And I saw, the Bible says... That it was covered with thorns and nettles. The enemy was having his way. You know why? Because a little sleep, a little slumber, a creeping compromise. When we, creep, when we allow iniquity in our ranks, when we fold our arms to the devil's work in the church, my brothers and my sisters, little by little, the thorns and the thistles grow and choke us out. We ought to be diligent in this war that is waged upon us by Satan. In being firm as leaders of God's people. Not bend, not twist when it comes to the truth of God. We bring reproof. We bring correction. Not to cut people down, mind you, but to restore them. 
And if they will not be restored, the Bible says, let him depart. If a person rejects all methods of restoration, what more can you do? But the purpose of the church is to preach and teach restoration. But reproof must be given. Correction must be given. The leaders and us cannot tolerate any form of wickedness. Not wink at it. Not fold our hands at it. Not close our eyes and go to sleep and act like it never happened. Our final scripture for today. 2 Corinthians 11. And look at verse 2 through 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 2 through 4. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11. Paul said, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul's mission and goal is to bring the people into union with Christ. He himself had to be corrected in his work, reproved in his work, rebuked by God himself, and he was brought into communion with Christ. His sole mission is to preach the gospel and teach the people into relationship with Jesus Christ. He says, I have espoused you to one husband that you may be perfected in Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Paul says, when I teach you to be in Christ, I want you to stand firm in Christ rooted in Christ, grounded in Christ. When you are grounded in Christ, you are grounded in truth. You are grounded in love. You should be immovable, unshakable, that even if I, Paul, come back and preach error to you, you should rebuke me. Not because I am Paul. When I bring error to you, it is your duty to know that I am bringing error and rebuke me. He says, I wonder if somebody comes and preaches another Christ whom we have not preached or if he have received another spirit which he have not received or another gospel which he have not accepted, he might, bear well, he might bear with him. It is incumbent, brethren, that we solidify ourselves in Christ Jesus that no matter who comes with error, we are able to discern. The Bible says there is a time to drink milk. And there is a time where you should be teachers. Not babies drinking milk. For he that drink milk is unable to discern anything that is according to righteousness. That person cannot perceive good nor evil. And so my charge today. To Liberty International Ministries is to pray for your pastor, Pastor Sam Chapman, that he remains diligent to the work that God has called him to, that he will remain firm and fast as a man, as a needle to the pole, that he will not bend, he will not break in the truth and in the duty that God has called him to perform. The devil desires him to sift him as wheat. When he sifts the leader, he can sift the brethren. But pray as Jesus prayed for Peter. And Jesus prayed for Pastor Chapman. And Jesus prayed for you and me. Pray, my friends. Be constant and diligent in prayer for your leader and his wife. That they may stand firm against all the deceptions of the enemy and he prays for you as I pray for you and you for me that we are grounded and rooted in the truth immovable unshakable sealed with the Holy Spirit of God that no, that come what may you and I will continue to press towards the mark and the high calling which is in Christ Jesus and I guarantee you, when you and I remain faithful 
amidst a world of chaos and destruction, when we remain faithful to God, you and I will one day meet. And in the sweet by and by, we will echo through the ages, glory to God and thank, thanks to Jesus Christ who came and died that we all might live. Bow your heads with me, my friends. Father in heaven, to you be all praise, glory, and honor. I thank you for the words that you have placed on my heart to deliver to your people today. Dear Father, I can only deliver the words as you have delivered it in, in me. I pray that your people would have received the message today, and whatever your word was designed to do today, let it be done. Reproof, correction, encouragement, comfort, hope, strength, whatever it is, may your Holy Spirit minister to your people right now. I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. I hold none for myself. I am just your humble servant. So I give you all praise. I give you all glory. I pray, dear Lord, for Pastor Chapman and his wife. May you continue to strengthen them and keep them faithful in this service that you have called them to. I pray for every member of this ministry, local and international. Oh, dear Father, anoint them and bless them. Help them to grow in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help them to be rooted and grounded and established in this faith. Help them to stand firm in this faith. Come what may, knowing that should they live for you and even if they die and go to sleep, when you shall come, we all will be raised and changed in the twinkling of an eye and look forward to that day one of eternity. Until then, keep us faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I thank you for lending your ears to the last two messages for the past two weeks. Again, I thank Pastor Chapman and I thank you and I pray that God's will continue to be done in your lives and in this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.